In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are spilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought by the precious blood of Christ. In Christ alone, I pray. prayer, and then we'll uh, begin reading in uh, Luke chapter 7. Uh, God and our Father, it's a privilege and a joy to be together around the Word of God as we have mentioned that uh, your book, your voice uh, through the book will change our lives, transform our lives, and how we need it, myself first. So help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if, if you were here last week, we looked at a, a man called a centurion. He was a soldier commander over a hundred Roman soldiers. And we saw he had a servant that was sick, uh, but he wouldn't go to the Lord Jesus uh, himself. He felt unworthy. And he felt unworthy to even have the Lord come in his house, which is where his servant was. And we discussed last week how uh, that is uh, very right for a sinner, like we're all sinners, for us to understand that the Lord Jesus is, uh, is so great. Uh, he's the creator of heaven and earth who became a man. And we're all unworthy of his blessing, all unworthy of his presence, unworthy of even approaching him. So we mentioned last week that salvation is all by grace. It's a gift not something we deserve in any measure. It's a gift. We deserve judgment and that's it. So the Lord healed uh, the man's servant, the centurion's servant, without even going to his house. And uh, I'll read in verse 9, this is Luke chapter 7, verse 9, uh, what, uh, uh, what the Lord responded when the centurion had said that I know that you don't need to come to my house. You don't need to be physically here. All you need to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. And the Lord responded in verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned to him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Well, that's quite a statement because this... Uh, uh, centurion was a Roman. Uh, he wasn't a Jew, far from it. And uh, yet uh, he had greater faith than the Jewish people 
who were prepared or should have been prepared for their Messiah's coming. They had the word of God. But the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6 that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is, is vital. I mean, we have to believe God. And how do we know uh, what to believe about God? See, uh, I want to make a difference between believing in God and believing God. Many people believe in God. But to believe God is to believe what he has said, what he's revealed. Because you can believe in God and not know anything about him. And that's the case with most people. They'll say, well, I believe in God, if you ask them. They say, yes, I believe in God. Well, who is he? Well, they don't know. They don't know what to say. But uh, uh, Paul said in Acts 27, 25, he was in the middle of a storm uh, in a, a boat with a, a lot of people. And uh, he said, be of good cheer. I believe God. Because God had come, an angel had come and promised Paul that, it, he, that there wouldn't be any of the lives lost of the people on the ship. And Paul says, I believe God. So without the Bible, you, can, you can't say, I believe God, because you have never heard what he has said in order to believe it, what he has revealed in order to believe it. So uh, I hope you understand this. To believe in God, it all depends on what you mean by, I believe in God. Who is this God you believe in? Well, you'll never know who he is except you have the word of God. That's where God is revealed. I mean, he's revealed in the things that he's made in creation, certainly. And from that, we know he's an awesome God of infinite power and wisdom in the creation that he's made. But that won't tell me what he thinks about me. To, to know what God thinks about me, I have to have the Son of God, who's God in the flesh, came as in manhood in order that he might seek and save the lost, that he might touch the lives of, of sinful men just like you and I. And uh, that's, the, that's the wonder uh, of, of God's revelation in the Bible. It tells us about Christ. And so I can say, I believe God. God has said that uh, Christ uh, came into the world to save sinners. And in 1978, I said, I believe God. I'm a sinner. And he came to save me. So I hope you understand that you must, you must, you must, you must have the word of God. Not just to read the Bible as if it's some, you know, book that you read like in a class uh, when you're in school, but to read it so that God can speak to you, so that God can reveal himself to you. What a blessing. What a privilege. So uh, even as we gather here tonight, we, we prayed that God would speak to us. And so this man, the Lord says, he has great faith, greater than even in this religious people uh, Israel. And uh, so there's great faith. Later on uh, in a few chapters, the Lord will talk about little faith. And in Mark chapter 4 and verse 40, he'll talk about no faith. So great faith, little faith, and no faith. Well, we certainly don't want to be a part of those that have no faith. Uh, and fa what is faith? It's, uh, once again, it's to believe God. So God reveals himself and faith says, I believe God. I believe what you've shown me, O God. That's what faith does. Now, in trusting God in our daily circumstances, we might have great faith like this uh, centurion did and thought that the Lord could heal his servant without even going to his house. He was a humble man. He, he felt he was unworthy of the Lord's blessing and of the Lord's presence. He had great faith. Uh, little faith uh, is... Uh, to believe that God is a, a, a great God, but not to be able to apply God's greatness in my situation. In order to apply God's greatness in the situations of my life, when the problems and storms come in my life, I must have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Otherwise, I'll never have the love of God. I'll never have confidence that God loves me. It's in Christ I discover God loves me. Then in the circumstances of my life, I can know that God is with me. Why? Because he gave his son for me. He loves me. He'll not hold back any good gift for those that have uh, received his son as Lord and Savior. 
so then our faith can, uh, uh, we go from no faith to little faith. And then as we uh, grow as a Christian, uh, as we learn the Bible and experience God in our daily lives, then our faith grows. And, and, uh, and by God's grace, someday maybe we could have great faith. So uh, faith is not just believing in God. Faith is believing God. Now we go on from this centurion and in verse 11, uh, <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, verse 11, came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And this is, uh, the, he was in Capernaum, which is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee in Israel today. It's in northern Israel. And so about 20 miles to the southwest was this little city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. So a disciple is a follower. Uh, a disciple is a learner. And uh, we all should choose to follow the Lord, to learn from him. Uh, he is the, he's the great teacher, the great master. Uh, his life is the perfect example of what a righteous life should be. And so the disciples were with him, but also there was much people. And here is a distinction made between those that were learning from the Lord and those that were just traveling with him. Perhaps they uh, uh, wanted to be with the crowd. There was excitement and they wanted to see what was going on. Maybe they wanted to see a miracle. But whatever the case, they are not called disciples. They, are, they have no spiritual connection with the Lord. How important that is. To have a spiritual connection with the Lord means that you have faith in Christ, you received him as Lord and Savior, and now you've been born again, you have a new nature from God, and God is working in your life, he's the Lord of your life. And then this uh, situation in Nain, look what happens, it's a funeral service. In verse 12, now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, so here's his disciples, the Lord Jesus, and these others that are just traveling along. Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. So the a Lord approaches this small village, small city, and there's a funeral procession that's leaving the city. Listen. That's what this world ultimately will uh, brings to every man. It's death. This world, meaning a world that's without God, a world that is crucified, Christ, that has no place for God. I mean, look at our, our society. You, you know, there, there's no place for God in our society. Uh, they're pushing God further and further and further out. You know, it used to be in school. God could be taught in school and in the Pledge of Allegiance, so one nation under God. Everything is being pushed away so that people do not want God. Because with, why? Well, because with God comes accountability. I mean, if there is a God, of course there is, if there is a creator, and I have to believe in creation rather than evolution, then I'm going to be accountable to this God because he's created me. Well, I don't want to be accountable to God. I want to live my life any way I want. If, if, if I want to live an immoral life, if, if I want to, you know, party and waste my life away, that, that's my choice. I don't want God telling me what to do. That, that's why we're meeting in the way that we are tonight, is that we have followed the ways of the world and we have rebelled against God. But hallelujah, God's a God of the second chance. And so he brings the good news of the gospel it's a gospel good news for sinners. That means everybody has failed. Everybody needs God's love and forgiveness. So this is wonderful. But, you know, you're not going to get out of this world except it be in a coffin. That's the only way you're going to leave. Now, you, you all have had friends, and I've got friends that are already dead. I mean, th th they died maybe years ago, m maybe young. Think how hard it is for a mother a mother that has to bury her son. I know some mothers that have had to do that. Maybe you have experienced that also. Nothing more heart-wrenching for a mother than to have to bury her own son. But death is a part of this world. And the reason it is because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. When Adam sinned in the garden, 
God had told him, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, he didn't immediately die physically because there's physical death and there's spiritual death. There's a physical death where the body and soul and spirit are separated. Uh, the, put the body in the coffin and the soul and spirit return to stand before God. Or there is a, a spiritual death, which is a separation from God when we sin. And all of us have sinned, so all of us are separated from God spiritually. The Bible calls it being dead in trespasses and sins. That's in Ephesians chapter 2. Dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean? Well, I'm separated from God because I have chosen sin over him. And so now I have no connection with God. Do you understand that? You could go to church for the rest of your life and have no connection with God whatsoever. Dead to God. Separated from him. All you have is this religious sensibility that tells you that you'll be better off if you go to church. Well, that's a lie out of hell. I don't care who tells you that. It might be a preacher, a priest, or pope. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is Jesus Christ. He's the Lord. He is the Lord. you got to make him the Lord of your life. And when, when he comes into your life, he brings life. Life. Nobody can bring life. Look at this. This woman is going out. There's a big crowd of the city going out uh, in this funeral procession with her. They couldn't help her. Oh, they could put their arm around her and weep with her and, and so forth, but they really couldn't help her because this son is dead. Only God can come in at this moment. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. Look what happens here in verse uh, 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the coffin, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. <laughs> this is so great. Listen, this is the Bible. This is the word of God. So if you say you believe God, then you've got to believe who God is. Well, God manifested himself as a man. He came in manhood, and he has power over death. Jesus Christ has power over death. There's no other man has power over death. But he had compassion on this woman. You know, the Lord Jesus, he's the one that went to Lazarus' tomb, and three days after, four days after Lazarus was dead, he raised him from the dead. There are no limitations with God. And in your life, don't limit God. You, you'll never know what God can do in your life until you surrender your life to him. Otherwise, it's all going to be downhill. But look at this woman. She, she's, she's living in a world full of sin. It's full of death. It's full of sorrow, of brokenheartedness. That's all that this world offers until Jesus steps in. And you know, the Bible tells us that there's a coming day when there'll be no more sorrow. No more tears, no more death, no more pain. All these former things will have passed away. But if you want to enjoy that, you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And I hope you'll trust him even in this moment. Because if you don't, there will be suffering. There will be death. There will be sorrow and pain forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. In what the Bible calls the lake of fire, hell itself. If heaven is real, and everyone wants to believe that heaven is real, hell is real also. And so we need to face these things uh, head on. Jesus Christ came to save you and I from hell. Praise his name. Uh, I deserve to be there, but he saved me. That's what it means to be saved. You're in danger. You're going to hell, my friend, for your sins against Almighty God. And Jesus came to save you from that judgment. And not only to take uh, save you from hell, but to take you to heaven. And so that you can know the love of God and the blessings of God in your life even today. Well, this is so wonderful. So uh, he says to the young man, arise, verse 15, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak. <laughs> well, that must have obviously been a, a, a shock beyond all others 
to everyone that was there. You know, uh, a mortician is around dead bodies all the time. And uh, they might uh, talk to them, uh, sing to them. They might do whatever they want, you know. And uh, they would never get a response from a dead body. Jesus steps in. He is the resurrection and the life. And he commands, he commands this young man. He commands him uh, to uh, arise. Now, who could speak to those that are dead? Who could speak to a lifeless body and cause the soul and spirit to be reunited in that body? And this young man, he uh, 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 wakes up and, and he begins to speak. I wonder what he said. What would he have said? I mean, he wakes up, he finds himself in a coffin and all these people around him, they're be, he's being carried. <laughs> it's really uh, quite a fantastic uh, uh, thought when you think about it. And so, and then it says, he began to speak and he, the Lord Jesus, delivered him to his mother. Oh, how, how this is just incredible. Here is a broken hearted mother and the Lord had compassion upon her. He wants to, um, he sees her broken heart and he wants to bless her. And my friend, look at, the Lord looks at your heart also. Uh, he doesn't want to condemn you. That's not why he came into the world. He came into the world to bless you. Praise his name. And so he returns her son, her only son. She didn't, you know, she was a widow. Her husband's gone. Uh, you know, who's going to provide for her? And now the Lord has restored her son. You all have mothers. Uh, God would like to restore you to himself for the blessing of your mother. Some of you might have mothers or grandmothers that have been praying for you. I had a grandmother that prayed earnestly for me for years. Uh, she had passed away before I was ever saved. She never got to see the answer of her prayers. But you might have a mother or grandmother that's living that's praying for you. What a blessing. The Lord Jesus could present you to your mom and say, here is a, a new man. Here is a man that has given his life to me. You can trust him now. His love for you is, is, is deeper than it ever has been before. What a joy for a mother to receive back her son from the dead. You see, that's exactly the way we're living uh, you know, there's a man in the Bible, he's a man that he, he was full of demons, and he lived in a graveyard. Well, that's true for all of us. This world is just a world of sorrow and death. That's why we just saw that, this woman, uh, the Lord comes to this city, and, and what does he find? A funeral service. That, that's all this world is. When you live in sin, you separate yourself from God, and you will be separated from every relationship that is valuable. Divorce will come in. Uh, children will grow up without a father. It, 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 there's nothing but sorrow and sadness that comes uh, from sin and living in a condition of death. Remember, a condition of death is to be separated from God. Now, you can have, uh, you know, you can be with the homeboys all you want, but if you're separated from God, then there is nothing that will satisfy your soul. Nothing. And I, I, and I am quite certain that if you're here tonight and Jesus Christ is, is not your Lord and Savior, your soul is empty. Your soul is searching. And you need to be honest enough to admit that you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you've been. You don't know how to get to any place other than where you are right now. You need to cry out in the name of Jesus for God's mercy. God will show you mercy. Praise his name. And so he goes on in verse 16, and there came a, a great fear, awe, awe upon all the people, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. Well, you don't have to read far in the Bible in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, and the Lord Jesus is called Emmanuel. And you probably know that Emmanuel, that name means God with us. And see, the Lord Jesus is not just a prophet, one that came to speak for God. He's God. God is speaking in the person of the Son of God. And 
He is Emmanuel. He came to be with us. My friend, listen. He cannot be with you except you receive him as Savior and Lord. His name is Jesus. That means Savior. You've got to receive him as your Savior before God can ever be with you. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that God is with you if Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior. And so these people said God hath visited his people. Well, he did. His people were Israel. But what did they end up doing? Rejecting him and crucifying him. So the problem was not with God. God came in mercy and kindness and love, and we see him showing it right here in raising this widow's son from the dead. The problem is with humanity, unbelieving humanity. And then verse 17, And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. You know, how did it go out? How did this message go out? Well, men carried it. They saw this happen. You know, uh, every one of us, when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have a testimony. You have a new beginning. And you go out and you tell people about that new beginning. Now, your life has to be in order. You, you, you can't uh, go out and tell people you're a Christian if you're not seeking to honor the Lord with your life. It doesn't mean it happens overnight, but when you fail, you admit that you've failed. That's so important. You would confess your sin to God, and if you sin against somebody else, you confess it to them. But the point is, is that you become a new man, and you can tell people about Christ, what he did for you. That's why I'm telling you, in 1978, he saved me. Well, that was a long time ago. But I praise and thank him for that salvation, it, 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 just as much as I did then, more than I did then, really. Because now I understand how great a Savior that he is, or understand a lot more anyway. So you need Christ. This is all about what real great faith is. Great faith is trusting Christ. Great faith is believing, not just believing in God, but believing God. Believing what God has said about his Son, the Lord Jesus. And it requires faith. Believing trusting his word, and then he can do great miracles in your life. He can bring you out of that condition of death and sorrow where sin rules in your body. You wonder why you've never been able to get free from this, uh, these sinful things? Because sin is reigning in your body. You need to give your life to Christ and let Christ rule. Let him be the authority in your heart. Hallelujah. And he'll change you if you give your life to him. Let's pray. A blessed God, thank you for tonight. Uh, we thank you that you came into the world, uh, that you might take away this sin and this death and the sorrow and failure and all that's associated with it, Lord. And uh, you've done that in my life. You've hopefully done it in these men that are here tonight. Oh, God, if there's one that you've not, uh, that has not received you, we pray tonight would be the night that they would say, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart, I give you my life, and I give you my sins, believing that you died for me. I have nothing to offer. I, 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 I must depend upon your grace because I have nothing to offer you. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Wash my guilt away. Give me a relationship with God. In Jesus' name, amen.